Sweet. Yeah, we're live. 6.59. Made it <laughs> just in the nick of time. Tonight, we're going to talk about boost control, more specifically boost control on a positive displacement blower. And you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, Richard, yeah, that has a pulley on it. So isn't the boost controlled by the pulley? Yes. And also, no. <laughs> As we saw from the video that I just posted today, we can adjust the boost by opening the bypass valve. So what we did in the video, if you guys haven't seen it, spoiler alert, we open the bypass valve. And what happens basically is you're creating a gigantic, in this case, boost leak. How big was the boost leak, you ask? I'm glad you asked. The boost leak was about nine pounds. <laughs> so we dropped down from 15 pounds to, well, well from 14.2 to about 5.1 pounds. So 9.1 pounds, I think, was the, was the complete drop in boost. So right off the bat, that tells us, hey, look, if you put a big hole in the system, <laughs> you can you can reduce the boost. Not not terribly surprising. We need to talk about what's happening when that happens. There's a lot of happening going on there. And we also need to talk about then how you would control it, because lucky for us, although it's not a wastegate per se, like we have with the turbo that releases some of the exhaust pressure, um, and exhaust flow to try to limit boost pressure. What the bypass valve does, it can well, the way that it functions, it can actually do a very similar thing. And I, I got a comment today from the guy at Churches, and he said he's actually using that on uh, an LSA blower on a factory deal. And he's even doing it in, um, you know, he can adjust the boost. Uh, it can be gear dependent. So he's gone even one step further from what I'm talking about. So what I want to do is obviously if we have 14 pounds with the pulley with the bypass valve closed and we have five pounds with the bypass valve open, we want the stuff that's in between there. So if you open the bypass valve all the way, we take off nine pounds. If we open the bypass valve halfway, <laughs> does that mean the boost is going to be now at 10 pounds or 11 pounds or 12 or whatever the number is? But you can see how that works what you're doing is metering the bleed orifice. So you're changing how much of a leak you have. So if you have a little bit of a leak, it still makes most of the boost. If you have a big leak like we did, it changes the boost dramatically. The key then would be having that, controlling that boost leak, controlling the position of that valve. If you think of the, for those of you who are not familiar with it, a bypass valve is an awful lot like a throttle. A throttle body so if you have a throttle body you know it has a blade it moves you know back and forth opens and closes that's what the bypass valve is doing the bypass valve is controlled by uh, a diaphragm actuator that has a spring in it and what it does is the way that it's set up at least on the supercharger is when it is under vacuum the the vacuum draws the diaphragm the diaphragm draws the lever the lever opens the valve when you go to wide open throttle, what happens to the vacuum behind the throttle body? Because it's it's taking a reference between the throttle body and the blower. So that's where vacuum is present. When you go to wide open throttle, what happens to that vacuum? Well, there's no more vacuum <laughs> because there might be just a, a little bit depending on how restrictive the throttle body is. But presumably there's no vacuum between the throttle body and the blower or very little. And what happens is when there's no vacuum drawing on that diaphragm, it releases the diaphragm and it springs down and closes the bypass valve. With the bypass valve closed, we're free to make boost. And the nice thing is those things happen at the same time or you know, simultaneously. There are bouts because we get to zero vacuum before boost is built, we get to zero vacuum, it spring loads the bypass valve close, and then the blower is, is uh, free to complete, you know, to make boost. Here's what happens on our test that I did in the video, where we basically what I did was just why we just zip tied the thing open. So we had it open all the time. Um, we could have done it another way, but that was the easiest way. <laughs> so we, we, buy, we uh, opened the bypass valve and then ran the thing at wide open throttle. Naturally, with a big boost leak, the, the amount of boost that the blower could produce was much less because we were spinning at the same speed, but now it had a big leak that it had to overcome. It still produced some boost. In fact, on the load in where it was producing 14.7 pounds with the bypass valve open, 
And now it was creating only about two and a half pounds because all the rest of that was just leaking out. So your question should be, well, Richard, where was it leaking to? <laughs> um, normally, like on a wastegate, on a turbo application, we, when, you, when the wastegate opens, it just bleeds that exhaust a lot of times out to atmosphere. So that's the way that we do it on the engine dyno. It just bleeds it out the atmosphere. You can see the fire coming out. If I have some good video of, you know, when you see on a turbo application, the exhaust manifold's glowing, especially if you turn the light off, the exhaust manifold's glowing. Well, the wastegate's glowing too. It's red hot. And when it opens up, you can see the fire coming out of the valve. <laughs> that's the kind of environment the wastegate has to work on. The bypass valve doesn't have to work on that, on that hot of an environment because it's only dealing with um, the, the boost supplied by the manifold and not exhaust but it works in a similar fashion. So when the bypass valve opens up and when we're blowing boost through it, there's, it's still creating boost because the blower can create, it, it can process more air than that leak can allow to escape. So there's still a buildup of pressure. So we have about two and a half pounds there. And then as we go up in RPM, the blower is able to supply more than, and the, and the leak stays consistent. And so what we have is a rising boost curve. It's able to build more boost pressure and, and makes more power. So we, we went from about two and a half pounds to just over five pounds at the top of the RPM range. What happens with that air though is very important to, to remember because when, what happens is when the blower is building boost, the boost is, uh, forced through the air and water intercooler, which we have on this kit, because this was the kit that Tom Demuse did. And it included the sandwiched brick and air and water intercooler, along with a manifold and adapter plate that allowed us to put this Ford blower on the LS in the first place. So all the air, all that boosted air is going through the intercooler. And then some of it, some of it's going into the motor to make the power. Some of it's going back out the bypass valve. And the way that they have the bypass valve routed on these positive displacement blowers is it comes back in behind the throttle body, between the throttle body and the blower. So it's recirculating this air. So it's recirculating the air back into the blower <laughs> to then get compressed again and run back through the intercooler. And then some of it's going into the motor, some of it's going back around for another loop. So as you're making a run, you have stuff cycling back and forth through the motor. And then some of that, and if you could train all of the ones that have already been heated, all the air that has already been heated, to go into the motor like it's supposed to, but you can't do that. <laughs> so what it, what ends up happening, and I and, and unfortunately I don't, I, I'd have to see if I monitored this. I think I may have monitored this during the. Um, I should have put that in the video. I think I did monitor the charge temperature, and what we would see is the charge temperature might be a little bit hotter than we would normally associate with the same amount of boost if all we had was cold or ambient air being drawn into the throttle body and then into the blower and then pushed through the intercooler one time and then into the motor. So that's really the downside of controlling the boost or altering the boost with the bypass valve is because that air is just not going, you're not bleeding it to atmosphere. You're recycling it back through the blower. So that's a potential downside for, you know, I mean, a, a, a full throttle run is going to take, you know, a matter of how many ever seconds, unless you would do something silly like this and run it out of the silver state like I did. It's, it's, not, it's not a good idea. But ultimately, because we had probably had way more intercooler than we needed for a five pound blower kit, um, it probably was not an issue. But it's something to consider and something to consider as, if, as we go up and boost more. Um, but the thing is, the, the other benefit to that is as we go up and boost more, we're recirculating less of that air. So more of the good stuff is going into the motor, less is being recycled back through and, and, and then heated again and again and again. So that's what's going on with that. The problem then becomes not that we, can, we can't open the bypass valve as we showed in the video. We can open it up all the way. We can drop the boost dramatically. We can have it closed all the way. We have the two extremes of that. And then the amount that the boost drops is going to be a function of the size of the blower, how much airflow the motor's using, and also, not surprisingly, the size of the bypass valve itself. Now, there's a limit to how big the size of the, the bypass valve can be just because of space limitations. I mean, there's only so much valve that you can fit 
given the available real estate because you have the blower there, you have the throttle body there, you have the rotor pack there, you have the manifold, you know, you have a lot of things going on there and you have to have the structure of the blower and all that. So yeah, yeah maybe you could make that a little bit bigger if you wanted to, or maybe make it a little bit smaller, whatever. So the size of the, the valve itself is going to dictate how much flow can go through there. Because one of the things as a tangent, one of the guys suggested, well, yeah, now you should do that with a turbo, do a compound, run the turbo, just run the blower until the turbo can take over and then blow all the boost from the turbo through the bypass valve and, and just go around the blower. That's a nice thought. And that's, that's exactly what Lancia did, but they didn't blow it through the blowout valve. And just like the blowout valve, allowing the motor to make boost with the blower because it's not big enough to get all of that out. It's also not big enough just to function as the air primary air source with a turbo that's already wicked up. So it's it wants to make six or seven or 800 horsepower with a flow go through the bypass valve, even pressurized. That's just not going to be a good situation. It's not going to work out very well that way. So now we have to work on trying to control that bypass valve. But lucky for us, the bypass valve has fittings so that you can supply airflow boost or vacuum to both sides of that diaphragm the nice thing about that is that now we can with vacuum and with the right orientation of vacuum and boost lines and the right kind of pulse width modulated you know uh boost controller and and um you know electronic controller that would allow us to adjust that and basically op essentially open and close the valve by manipulating the amount of flow boost and vacuum that we would be supplying to that. I think that there also have to be a secondary valve there because I would want to open it with vacuum and then control it with boost. And so we still want it to open under vacuum. Um, you could also open it under boost, um, by having the boost go in the other direction, but the, all of that stuff can be figured out, but you just want to be able to control how much, um, flow, how much boost you're giving to that, to that valve. And then that, and, and you could do that by pulse with modulating it. And then you could control how far you open the valve and how far you open the valve is going to control how much boost the combination is going to make. And so the cool thing about that is once you've figured that out, and apparently people already have on some of the factory setups, this particular one that he was talking about was, I think, was, I think an LSA blower uh, run on a ZL1 or something. And so if you can control that, then what you do is you can take the 15 pound blower pulley like we had on our 5.3, and then you can have that be anywhere from 15 pounds all the way down to whatever the minimum was. It was five pounds or you know 14.2 pounds or whatever. It would go all the way from there down to five pounds. So you basically have a 10 pound range that you can play with. And if you were really sharp at tuning and your controller would allow it and, and could be manipulated based on things like different gears, different engine speeds, you know, you can hook detonation to it because that's the factory does that sometimes. You can control it um, based on a number of different variables and you could have optimized traction and optimized boost levels and, and all of that. And it would be a good system rather than just having you basically, because before that, what you would have to do is essentially control the boost level by pulley size, which is one way to do it. You put a five pound pulley on it, you get five pounds, but a 10 pound, you get 10 and so on. If you want less than that, if you have a 15 pound pulley on it and you want less boost than that, you just give it less throttle. You're controlling the valve. Like we were talking about, like we were talking about controlling the bypass valve. You're controlling the valve of all the airflow going into the motor by controlling the angle of the throttle. And you can do that also. <laughs> but that's a lot more difficult <laughs> because you're wanting to go to full throttle. And also while you're racing and going, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to keep your foot steady on the throttle and all that. So having it controlled by a computer with electronics with a controller, and if you dial in 10 pounds and that's what you want, then that way you could, you could have it set at a lower boost level for driving around on pump gas. And then when you put race gas in it, you could have it set on kill. You could have it attached to, if you're real sophisticated with your setup, you would have it attached to, you know, um, fuel sensors so that it, it could determine whether or not you had 91 in or E85. Um, and it could adjust, it could also, in addition, in 
addition to adjusting the boost, it could also adjust the timing that you want. So there are a lot of elaborate things that could be done, even with a positive displacement blower, you could do a similar thing with a roots or with a twin screw blower, but that's much easier to control with a, a, a wastegate type of deal. And since it's blowing through there, it's not a big deal. But I think it's kind of cool to be able to control that with a, a positive displacement blower and then regulate boost to a lower level than normally what the pulley would allow. And I think that that's kind of cool. And, the, the, and it's also cool that there's guys out there doing it. And I demonstrated what <laughs> what the what the big ranges are, what the you know what the, both ends of the of the book are. And it's cool that you can now get stuff in the middle. So church is here. So yeah, you're talking about it. That's awesome. Um, the other thing that I did was <laughs> did some wild mathematical speculations on what the what the power losses were associated with the superchargers. I've been telling people for years, and and the formula still holds true that you can double the horsepower of a naturally aspirated motor by adding a turbo and running 14.7 pounds of boost. You run one more atmosphere, you get you know you get another NA motor basically on top of that because you've added another atmosphere. That can happen under the right circumstances. It doesn't always happen. And sometimes it's more than that. But usually it's less than that. On a, on a positive displacement blower, it's almost always less than that. And, and I don't know that I have a situation where it's actually, we've been able to do that on a PD blower. That just doesn't happen. And the reason that it doesn't happen is not because the formula is not accurate. It is. The reason that it doesn't happen is because there's, there's power consumption from the blower. Just like spinning an alternator or a water pump or power steering or an air conditioning, it takes power to drive that supercharger. And on superchargers, more than it, more than all of the other accessories combined, a supercharger is going to take way more than all of those. And so it takes a lot of power for that supercharger to process the amount of air against resistance that it has to process in this situation. So it's not unusual. I've talked about this before. Some of these blowers can be 100, 200, even 300 horsepower on regular side, like 20, I'm talking about 2650 and lower kind of blowers. You know, everybody brings up top fuels, which, which might be more than 1,000 horsepower to drive that blower on a 10,000 horsepower motor. <clears throat> so it takes power to drive those. And the amount of power that it takes to drive those is not fixed. It's, it's dependent on a number of things. It's dependent on the speed of the blower the amount of flow being processed by the blower and the arp, the uh, and the boost pressure that is providing the resistance for it for it to feed against. So all of those things and and the blower design itself too is a big part of this. So a, a twin screw blower typically has less parasitic loss than a root than a positive displacement root style blower. Even the TVS, I know the TVS guys are going to be up in arms, but. If you read any SAE paper ever written about twin screw blowers, they're they're fundamentally a better design. And if you look at the L evolution of a roots blower, of a positive displacement blower like the Eaton stuff that has been used on so many OEM applications because they're good quality things, they last a long time and they provide the amount of power and reliability that's necessary at the OEM level. But if you look at the development of those, what they've done is make that blower and the lobe design more like a twin screw. It's not there yet. It's still a it's still a roots blower. It's a hybrid, but it it, it doesn't do what a twin screw does. So the twin screw provides internal compression, which is one of the big differences between that and and a typical root style blower. So, <laughs> but I digress. Um, but. But they still work, and and the thing is that each one of those designs requires, and 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 each one of those displacements require a different amount of power to spin at different speeds and, and different power outputs that they're supplying. So it's a function of many things. So how much power you're losing is going to be lucky for us that the amount of power that they're losing coincides with the amount of power that they're supplying. So if we have a thousand horsepower blower, we're losing more with that blower. But we're also gaining, so it's really a net gain, even though we're losing some of it. But that's the reason why they do not, uh, they do not like follow the formula that turbos do, because you don't have that sort of parasitic loss associated with driving a turbo. You have a different kind of loss, but it's not that, and it's much, much less, if any at all, <laughs> compared to a 
compared to a driving a supercharger, whether it's a centrifugal or, or either form of positive displacement load. So that's why they don't for, follow the formula. That's one of the things guys brought up a lot in the comments was that, hey, I thought that you said that this this that, that we should double the power up, but this thing should be making a lot more power at 14.2 pounds. Well, yeah, I agree. There are other things going on because then they what they were saying was, I think that the losses that, that I was estimating there, and again, it was just a flip of a coin, you know, pie in the sky kind of thing, just a, a, an estimate using fun math. And as I said, the best way to do it is put it on a blower dyno and the blower dyno will actually tell you so that you can stabilize the RPM and the flow and the boost and all that. But the, what they were estimating, what the numbers that they were getting, they were using the formula. Okay, Richard, if, if we ran nearly one atmosphere, it should make nearly double the power. It's not making that. So if we subtract the number that it made from double the power number, that should tell us what the loss is. Yes. And no, <laughs> the reason that there's a no there is because we have other things that we change with the blower that weren't part of the NA combination. One of the big things is the intake manifold. Did the intake manifold affect the peak power? Would it make more peak power with the long runner intake manifold that we ran on? In this case, it was a truck intake manifold. Would it make more peak power with that manifold than it would if you just ran the the blower manifold NA by itself. What would happen in a comparison between the two? No, we don't really care. We know it's going to lose power through most of the curve because it doesn't have runner length. That's normal. But is it going to lose P power, which is the number that we're using for the calculation? Is it going to lose that? The other thing that's happening is we probably have, and I didn't measure vacuum between the throttle body, even the big throttle body and the blower, but at this power level, do we have an airflow restriction? So the airflow restriction is also going to limit the amount of power that we would get even at that same boost level. Although now that I say that out loud, <laughs> that's not accurate because if there is an airflow restriction, we're going to see more power. But the other thing we're going to see is also more boost. So we'd be multiplying using a different number. <laughs> so see, that's why I'm here because I learned from myself. Um, but there, but there is a difference between those two, those two things. So the, and that's why the turbo, you know, if you're if you're looking at strictly from making a certain amount of horsepower per pound of boost, it's really hard to beat the turbo. The turbo doesn't do what the blower does. Um, I'd like to see one of these one of these positive displacement blowers run with a long runner manifold like Freiberger did with the with the tunnel ram and the and the big 871 that they ran on. Long runner manifold, intercooler, then the blower, and then a big inlet as big as we can make the inlet, and then also. Um, <laughs> make sure that you pin the lower crank pulley. And then what we would run into ultimately, I think of this combination is the blower is big enough and can support enough power that we probably would run into belt slippage with a six rib belt. I think that this thing would have to have at least an eight rib. Super Ranger mud truck. Is there a way to run a turbo with a normal carb? Uh, yes, I've done that before. But it usually doesn't work under every situation. It doesn't work like we got it to work under wide open throttle. I ran a normal carburetor, put lots of jet in it. I even ran the normal carburetor as a blow through on E85. But I did it on the 292 inline six cylinder. And we did it on, on one of those um, XP5512 two barrel carburetors. And it worked pretty well. But that's because we threw 100 jets at it and ran E85 on it, and it got the air fuel to where it needed to be at wide open throttle, and it ran fine. But that same combination would not drive around. <laughs> it would not be very good. Um, you normally have to make modifications to the carburetor. Um, the other way to possibly do it is to enclose it in an enclosure like Vortec has done and Paxton has done. Not just put a bonnet on top of it, but if you enclose the carburetor, usually you can get away with running boost on a normal carburetor. You just have to make sure that you boost reference the regulator so that you always have seven pounds more than the boost pressure is going in to feed the carburetor. Because you, you have to have positive pressure feeding the carburetor beyond whatever the boost is. So that, that can work. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my spiel for tonight. <laughs> Hopefully you guys all watched the video and got some good information for it. And I got some more stuff obviously coming up because they did a lot of testing while I was down there. We're going to take a look at some camshafts next. I've got the thousand horsepower big block stuff coming up. So we got a lot of stuff coming up, coming your way.
I'd like, I like the Bolton 871 on my six liter. I did a 671 and it works pretty good. It works really good when you run E85 through the blower. It really, really likes it. Oh, you have a, an AVS. I've never run one of those carburetors on a blow through. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to work. Uh, I've only ever run Hollies, um, even on the in carb enclosures for the Vortec and Paxton. We've only ever run um, uh, those Holly style in, inside the enclosures. Let's roots, most, most root cell blowers start getting inefficient above 23 or 24 PSI. <laughs> I, I'd say the number is a lot lower than that. Uh, how much boost are we talking about on average with these GT500 blowers? We just ran 15 or 14 pounds, 14 and a half pounds. Um, they'll, they'll obviously do more than that, but the, the amount of boost is not what you should be concerned with. You should be concerned with power. You want the boost to be low and the power to be high. Hey, Richard, do you know the limit of the stock 5.3 intake and throttle body? And if a 92 millimeter will fit a stock intake manifold, a 92 millimeter will not fit a stock intake because the opening of the intake of the stock truck manifold is 78 millimeters. You might be able to bore it, you know, port it out, although I don't know why you would. The the inlet side going into that intake manifold is not going to be that limiting. If you want to make more power, put a Trailblazer SS, but it's not just the inlet size into the manifold on the Trailblazer S that, that has it make more power. It's the, des the design, the manifold itself. Same thing with a fast. And we've made 1,100 horsepower with a stock truck manifold and a stock truck throttle body under boost. How does the Paxton SN93 ball bearing supercharger work? How do the that, that's a planetary drive is what it, is what that's called. It's a friction drive, and so it's not ideal. It's much better to have gears. Can we run a supercharger off a of cam gear? Double the speed, double the fun. It's going to be kind of hard on the timing chain, though, right? Wonder what size the throttle body was on the GT500 the blower came from. They have dual 65s, I think, on that. Uh, you have me convinced to run E85. It's, it would be a lot happier. Anything under boost would be a lot happier. Would it be better to vent the bypass valve to atmosphere on that blower? You can't because it's it's the bypass valve opens up in in between the throttle body and the rotors. On some of the Kenny Bell stuff, you can do that because he runs his bypass valve externally, so you could you could vent it to atmosphere. Yeah, flex fuel sensors are really the way to go. In a seven PSI application, is a twin screw still worth it over a root cell as far as efficiency and heat? It depends on if that seven PSI is making a thousand horsepower. So if you have a really big NA motor and you're trying to make seven pounds on it, then the twin screw would be better. But on a, if you're running a junkyard 5.3 and, and you're running at seven pounds, I, I, I would just get a roots blower, a cheap one. Smallest pulley on the 2.3 that fits is a 2.4. And guys also use overdrive balancers on the GT500s. I'm curious where the stock 5.3 balancer factors in size-wise comparison in comparison to the stock GT500. I don't remember measuring the GT500, or if I did, it's been a really long time. I've run a few of those on the engine dyno. I could go back and look and see if I have any data on that and see if I mention it and then measure it versus the, the truck manifold. Or not truck manifold. I got manifold on my mind versus the um, truck damper. 
I, I don't puppet master. I don't know about the price. You have to talk to the guys at Demuse. I'm not involved in any of that. Uh, Casey, I made a comment about putting a turbo on a 5.3 at the same PSI and see how much more horsepower it would make. I think it would be a close approximation of how much horsepower the blower takes to make. Um, we just don't know how much the, the turbo takes away to, to make. But it would it would give us another you know viewpoint. I bought the turbo exhaust manifolds from eBay. I thought that I brought you exhaust manifolds. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't <laughs> just use the factory ones if you can't you weld them. Does anyone know how to run E85 on a Gen 2 LT1? It's the same as running E85 on anything else. You just need a bigger pump and bigger injectors and then boost. If you're running it NA, I wouldn't bother running it on a Gen 2 LT1. Uh, a cam a cam is driven at half crank speed, yes. Two M90s is the way to go. Yeah, I've run across a couple of, but when we ran the, the exhaust manifolds or, or headers that because they're tubular that we run on the big bang stuff, I don't really like. I'd like to do a dedicated set that are actually headers for the dyno specifically because those are terrible. The plug access is bad and they want to burn plug wires and I just, I hate them. I like the stock exhaust manifolds turned around the way that we run them because they have unlimited plug access. They retain heat and stuff. I honestly don't think that they flow as well as those headers do. And the motor definitely sounds different with the headers on there. GT500 stock replacement balancer is 7.225 according to ATI. Couldn't you gut the blower and figure out the parasitic losses from NA versus boosted using the Super Richie formula? Um, that might be another way to do it. On an L33, how much power loss of the H62 heads versus 243 is given the same bottom end and compression rating? I, I don't know that there would be any. That there might be a power gain. Do logs affect higher PM under boost? You mean log manifolds? I, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't from a design standpoint, I wouldn't think so if you make them flow enough. You can run the turbo without connecting to the intake, put a restriction on it so you have X PSI. Uh, that's not going to work. The problem with trying to do that with a turbo, you can do that with a centrifugal blower. You cannot do that with a turbo because you not, do not have the boost going into the motor to create the exact extra exhaust flow <laughs> that you would have when that thing is under boost. So that method doesn't work with a turbo. Yeah, air-cooled stuff for E85 or, or even methanol is good for that. Always wonder if twin screws lost efficiency and low boost. <laughs> Efficacy. <laughs> Your channel and knowledge is very appreciated. Thank you very much. I go on the scroll on back. Uh, 
Uh, I'm just scrolling back to see what's going on. Yep, don't forget the thumbs up. Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't have a poll yet. Dang it. You guys, you guys got to remind me earlier than that. Okay, can you control boost on a positive displacement blower with a bypass valve? Why are you talking about that? I know church is going to get this right. <laughs> uh, I missed the begging. I wonder when the crossover PSI from when the blower is a restriction and then the parasitic loss from spinning it. Uh, all things boost. I'm new to LS, but how does gapping the rings work? Pull apart the whole bottom end, gap the rings, and put it back together. Yeah, we don't... When I do the junkyard motors, that's all I do. I clean the ring lands also, because there's going to be usually a bunch of stuff on a real high mileage motor, especially in the oil rings, you got to clean those. But then, I, yeah, we just gap them and put them back together. I use I reuse all the old stuff. Uh, I don't normally reuse the head gaskets. Um, I know Matt does sometimes, but... Normally on these high mileage ones, when you take them apart, it, it kind of destroys the gasket. I thought twin screws lost efficiency at low boost because they compress internally. So if you aren't boosting above that number, you end up with a parasitic loss. No. Going back on what you said yesterday, how do you determine when a supercharger engine needs more pulley as opposed to more engine? Well, my question would be, what is it? Are you what are you trying to do? If you have a given engine and you want to make more power, and you, the method that you're choosing to make more power is turning the boost up, then you put then you put more pulley on it. If you're building a combination and you want to make as much power as you can at the lowest boost level you can, then you make the motor more efficient. And you can do that even when you already have the combination. That's why we put camshafts and turbo motors and blower motors and, and, any, and any motor, because it makes the motor more efficient. So if you make the motor more efficient, what happens, especially with the camshaft, cylinder head, those kinds of things, you make the motor more efficient, what happens is the power goes up and the boost comes down, which is an ideal situation. No, there won't. There, there will not be a hundred percent on the poll, even though I just told everybody what the answer was, for like fifteen minutes. Uh, Thomas, you can't just create a, a, an orifice that produces the given amount of boost, because the turbo uses both sides. It uses positive pressure going in the inlet side and that positive pressure going into the airflow going into the inlet side creates more power and then when we create more power what happens to the exhaust flow so in your scenario there we don't have the extra exhaust flow as part of the equation on a centrifugal blower it's okay well it's still not okay <laughs> because we don't have the same thing but it's a little bit better situation the the ideal way to test the, how much power the blower makes or how much the blower costs um is to just put it on a blower dyno it's really easy uh we are moving does the belt stretch under load yes it does and and it stretches more when it's new and then it seems to kind of take a set after that and then it's then it seems to be fairly consistent um, and then it stretches when it can't you know maintain grip under its desired load <laughs> wait you can control boost with a bypass valve didn't why didn't somebody tell you that yeah screw compressor is very good they're using centrifugal blowers for um uh, air systems in shops as well and I'm told that that works very well, um, but a, a, a twin screw is pretty good.
<laughs> can we create the extra exhaust by injecting extra calories to the engine via nitrous and and monitors <laughs> what yeah that's an awful lot going on there uh t that's been my argument with the epa shouldn't beat on hot rodding because in most cases it improves the efficiency of the motor good luck using logic there uh oh grooves is in the house <laughs> I like how he just steps in and announces himself. Hello, fellow keyboard warriors. I'm here, ready to tell to tell everybody else on the internet how they're wrong. So you are part of the internet. I still want to know if the blower will spin faster with a shorter belt. No. Same, same speed. I don't remember the old ad selling kits to turn air cooled VW engines into air compressors. I just remember the ones that had the um, on the back of uh, what the heck were they? They're the ones that sold the X-ray glasses and stuff. The back of comic books, I think. And they also had the like um, flying cars that you hook the vacuum motor up to and it blows air down. We thought we could fly around and top of people's houses and stuff. All, all it does is create an air cushion and allows you to move heavy stuff. But still, it was magic. Boy's Life, that's another one. That's right. And Nun's Life and fat ca uh, Cat Fancy. Hover, hovercrafts, yeah. Except we thought that they flew. <laughs> nice, Dan. Tip your waitresses. I'll be here. They need the they tip your waitresses. They need the money for makeup. On my 144 blower small block 350, I like where this is going. It was only a six rib belt at 10 pounds of boost. The belt would slip. Yeah. Jeremy, so you just voted no just because you were you're a no guy. Have you ever heard of anyone having too much tension on a serpentine supercharger belt? On on vortex stuff where it was not um, spring loaded, where it was a fixed tensioner, and we just <laughs> just reefed on it to get as much tension as we could. We put so much tension on it that it would that it would bend the mounting plate. Um, and it also load the front main bearing on the five liters that we were doing it on. So it can be too tight. I'm using a tensioner from a Cummings 12 liter LSX diesel and it seems perfect. Yeah, if it's a spring loaded tensioner, I doubt that that's going to be a problem. I mean, the kind of tension we were putting on it was like breaker bar stuff. The blow through whistle, the one that spins the little impeller around. I still want one of those. Woo! Would make that kind of noise. <laughs> the ventriloquist thing, that's right, to help you throw your voice. That's right. And the and the uh, and the Charles Atlas stuff too, that you know you could kick sand in their face and stuff. That somebody kicks sand in your face and then you took a Charles Atlas course and then you were able to get the girl because you could kick sand in their face. There's a lot of sand kicking. That's what I'm saying. Oh, the exhaust whistles. I saw I saw Cletus did one of those or four of them or something. Uh, have you ever seen the big 100 CFM, the bigger compressors they used to run? Jackhammers. Those have a V8 in one head. It's just a compressor. Nice. Yep, kicking sand. Chuck. Charles Atlas. Hanging out on the beach, probably Venice Beach, or Muscle Beach, I would imagine. Let's see, how's our how's our poll doing? Really, nineteen percent saying no <laughs> for all that. Hope he's listening in class. The seahorse, the sea, but they, that's because they weren't seahorses, Dan. They were sea monkeys. I hope you we weren't feeding them horse food. <laughs> were you feeding them hay? 
50 piece fishing kit. Those actually did work. We caught fish with those. I mean, all you need is a string and a bobber and really you don't even need the bobber. We used to go down to the creek here, the local creek, and we would usually find the stuff that we need to fish because there was always people down there doing it. You, you just take a stick and wrap the string around it and get a little hook and we would catch the crawdads and then take their tails off and then use the crawdad meat for bait and throw it in there. And then we were catching little bluegills. You, you probably didn't want to eat them out of that creek though. Yeah, dynamite wouldn't be good for fishing. M80s, though, I think probably work fairly well. I have a pocket fisherman. It used to be up, up there, and I've used it many, many times. I still have it. Ron Popeil, pocket fisherman. That's the best fishing pole ever. Da, 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 da. Uh, I wish that you knew Oldsmobile stuff. There's nothing that I don't know. Just ask the internet. I would love to know what factory heads would be best for my 350 Olds. Oh, of all of the factory Oldsmobile heads? Are there any Oldsmobile people here that can help this gentleman out? Uh, mackerel. Yeah, there's lots of mackerel um, right off of the piers normally. Uh, one thing that I did get was a BB gun that ran off a of Freon. Oh, that would be good. Shot 4,000 BBs a minute. <laughs> wow, that's pretty serious. That's a super daisy repeater, huh? I was actually sighting in my, I have a, um, a 22 caliber pellet gun that I was shooting with my son yesterday. We were sighting it in. So we were shooting it, um, I don't know, it was, it was about that size from 900 yards away. It's just my backyard. My backyard's got to be like 900 yards, right? At least. It's pretty accurate, though. Uh, Richard, do you think holding the bypass valve open on a PD blower would help to keep engine and air temps down during road courses? I think if you're wanting to run that, um, it, it's going to... The bypass valve is going to operate during D-cell. Um, but I think if you're wanting to run with the bypass valve open like we did in the test, you'd be much better off just turning the boost down. I have a Mallory Unilite for an Oldsmobile. That's a unique piece. In Puerto Rico, I volunteered with DNR to do electro fishing, just a generator hooked up a chain, dragged underwater, and just have the fish <laughs> scoop them up and tag them. Oh, nice. So you did it, it didn't kill them, right? It just shocked them. And then you did you did you do a catch and release? I remember charting a boat out of Fort Bragg, baiting up and asking who's got my bobber. Bobbers always work. I did do a trip out of, um, we went out of San Francisco and we went out to the Farallon Islands because I did a great white shark cage dive and not, didn't see anything except for plankton and jellyfish. These alleged great white sharks. Have you seen the hydrogen engine that looks like a rotary stacked, extremely lightweight, 80 pounds, high horsepower torque, stackable for increased output, 25,000 RPM, and idle that was 1,000? I wonder how it sounds. No, I'll have to take a look at that. I don't think I have seen it. Five or six are tough to find. How are the four A heads from the 403? Would they work on my 76? See, I don't know chamber sizes or anything on any of those. C, C heads or 80 cc's. You want smaller chamber for comp? See, I was just asking that. Oh, just zaps them for a bit. <laughs> I think I have a nibble yet. 454K Sewell. Yeah, that's a good size BB gun. How about a 700 Nitro pellet gun? We see GSWs near the Farallons when they had a commercial salmon license. Yeah, they're out there. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We just didn't see any when I took my, you know, when I took my trip. Uh, 
Uh, Richard, which lobe count is more efficient? Um, the four by six is a better lobe design. So I'm trying to convince, it might be, let's see, who am I trying to convince here? I'm kind of, oh, Aaron, Aaron is here, right? So I'm trying to convince Aaron to like maybe sell me one of his Pontiac motors. <laughs> I'd like a 400, Aaron, if you've got that. Danny, what supercharger can I get for a six liter LS? I call Summit Racing, was told they can't get it. They can't get a supercharger? There's lots of superchargers for a six liter LS. Torque Storm has them, Pro Charger has them, uh, Vortec has them, Paxton has them, Whipple has them. Kenny Bell doesn't have them anymore for the LS. All right, Todd, man, take it easy. Any G I haven't done any Jeep engines either. I wanna do a four liter. Yeah, I did see the I Do Cars guy do, do the five-cylinder Atlas without breaking a single head bolt. Did he? I, I didn't notice that. How much would one of the blowers cost with the adapter? Any if I, I don't know. And I have no idea on price. I just, I, I, they just loaned it to me. Richard, did you see the dive boat that near the... Sirocco Islands that crashed and sank. I did not. Oh, you want the 400 for your lemons? <laughs> Le Mans. Uh, what's the most affordable blower for an LS? Well, the blower itself, the, the GT500s are cheap. So th those are pretty affordable. Um, it's the, the adapter and everything that you need. Uh, do a four liter into a four six. I don't, won't, won't probably do a stroker out of the Jeep engine. I would rather just do boost. So where are we at? We're still at 81%. Yes, 81 and 19. We only have 93 votes though. What's what's going on? Uh, Michael, what kind of motor was that? Oh, a Jeep. Okay. Uh, Kurt is suggesting an LSA from the boost district. Uh, Richard, just watched the video. Did it make more horsepower per PSI without bypassing? Um, yes, it did. It made, just running the blower on there, it made 19.5 horsepower per PSI. But I was just measuring the difference of the <laughs> 5 PSI based on the NA one. Excuse me. It it was only um where was it? Uh it was not very much. 4.5 horsepower per psi <laughs> when it was bypassed. It wasn't doing very well. Uh do you normally put your number on emails? It it is it is I just have it set up that way. It's on all of them. What's the latest on the 500 Caddy? It's still just sitting there. Blowers are getting hard to find. The Ford guys are dealing with an 80 week waiting list for Paxton. Holy moly. I think a 424 with a 3.8 liter supercharger top end would fit under the doghouse of a 98. I have no idea about hood fitment stuff. Mr. Lopez, hello from Mexico. I thought it made more during bypass. No, the bypass valve opened, it only made five pounds.
it only made five pounds and only made 450 horsepower and it made 427 na <laughs> so at five pounds of boost it made 23 horsepower that's not really very good So it, it essentially took three or four pounds was my point. It took three or four pounds of boost just to break even to get past the parasitic loss. Although, as I said, it was the parasitic loss associated with running that blower at a speed high enough to support 700 horsepower and not 450. So you made it exactly 100 votes. Nice. No, it makes five horsepower per pound of boost with the bypass valve open. The M122 and the 2.3 are 1,200 to 1,500 used. What's the biggest LS cam you have tested hydraulic roller tap it wise? Probably the one in the 495 that I did, the big stroker deal. That was the bottom of the page at the time for comp cams. I think that's probably the biggest hydraulic roller that I put in there. We need someone to start cranking blower flanges for custom intakes. All right. The blower flange part of it's very easy. The problem is the blower flange can't be universal for all kinds of motors. It just doesn't work that way. Tom said he found an M122 today for $550. Um, by the way, if anybody wants this Ford racing blower that I have, uh, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Mahovitz. So that one will be for sale as soon as I'm done testing. Um, he's It's just sitting at his shop, so he wants to sell it. If you're interested, send me an email. It, it's obviously not a use. The thing looks brand new. It's not new now that I've run it, but um, it's not a... It's not a used GT500 blower. It was, I think, for I think it was for originally for a kit for a Coyote or something from Ford Racing. So, Admiral, you just want a flange that fits the blower and is otherwise a square plate, so it can bolt onto a manifold or something. If that's what you're thinking. Yeah, Dodgy, it's, it, it makes a whole bunch less. <laughs> Out the blower on a bracket on the side of the engine and make a plate with a discharge tube. Yeah, you can do that. What point of the RPM curve did it make zero PSI? It never did. It, already, it, it, it always made boost. It made two and a half pounds on the load in and then made five pounds at the top. What's the largest Magnuson supercharger? I don't think Magnuson makes very big superchargers. I've, I've, I think that they have a 2650 now, but I've never tried a 2650. I think a 2.3 liter is the biggest one I've ever tried from them. <laughs> is it going to include the oval throttle body? I'm sure he'd sell you that. <laughs> Putting a 671 on a 413 Ohls, 3% underdrive, but I have to key the crank. Uh, does it need to come out of the engine or can it be keyed? You, you can put a, you can do the, you can pin these the way that we do it. Does your dampener already have a keyway in it? And why doesn't your crank have a keyway in it? Um, I don't understand. If it doesn't, you can pin it like we do. Just drill a hole. They have um, set up so that you can drill a hole between the crank and your damper, and then you just put a pin in there, and it works. You can even put two of them in there if you're really excited about it.
Is a parasitic loss with a bypass valve open much higher than it is with a closed? No, it's probably higher with it closed. Although it might be processing more air with less boost, but at the same speed. I don't know. I'd have to check that out. I'd have to check that out on the blower diner to see. If people crank out machined base flanges for cylinder head intake faces and machine blower tops, it's easy enough to connect the two. Yeah, what you're asking is not hard. It's just that it's not going to be universal for a bunch of different applications. You think there's a big difference in power output between the 60 degree twist of the roots and other aftermarket 60 degree twist superchargers? What what other aftermarket 60 degree twist superchargers are you talking about? Because more than likely, if there are other blowers out there, they all use the same rotor pack. Like Edelbrock, all of the 2650s all use the same rotor pack, whether they come from Edelbrock or Magnuson or directly from Eaton. or Those are all the same rotor pack, I think. If I send you a Lightning M112, will you dyno it on an LS? Uh, no, I don't have an adapter for the 112. And I already have a 112. I have a 112 from a 03 Cobra. Oh, it was for the blower hub and not the balancer. Okay. Just want to say thanks for the amount of detail you put into the videos. This whole series has been awesome. I and I like doing it. I love doing the testing on the blower. Finally getting it up on there. It took a little bit. <laughs> took a little bit of work, but finally getting it up on there and running. Because I haven't run a positive displacement blower like that. A roots one on an LS uh, for a long time. The last time one I ran was a 671. And that's not, that's a representative of what most people, most LS guys would be putting on their cars. They would be putting in these LSA blowers or this kind of blower, um, you know, it's 2650 obviously would be good. They would be putting all those on there. And, and that way, when I do camshafts and show them, hey, this is what it does, even though a 671 would show the same thing, it, I think it's much more relatable for most people. 140 views and only one thumbs up. <laughs> there should be one. There should be more than one, right? Uh, Alan, you're using the same... A Ford Motorsport TVS 2300 on my 1UZ. Nice. An SC400. It's a soarer. That's right. I can control the boost with bypass valve with my MoTeC. That's right. That'll be cool. Let me know what happens. What's the company name that makes the GT500 blower adapter for the 5.3? It's called Demuse Engineering. And Tom is here in the chat. So if you want to ask Tom questions about it, he's here. Uh, I also like to say thanks for providing more data like the timing map. The guys want that stuff, and I, I want to be providing more of that stuff. Definitely be interested in watching a four-liter series. There's a small community of us on Facebook. It would be cool for you to debunk all the myths and find out just what works. I, I got an interesting myth today from a guy that made a comment about Hemis, because Tom, I think, is going to do a – Tom is going to do a, an adapter – assembly for Hemi's too. And I, I hope to test that. But he was saying that the 6.4 Hemi, you can't run boost on. <laughs> so I asked him to explain why you can't run boost on the 6.4. And he said, because, because they're bored out five sevens and they don't have a cylinder wall thickness. I said, look, I don't know how much boost you're planning on running. I said, but I guarantee you that you can run boost on a 6.4 Hemi. No, you can't. I'm surprised. And then he got back at me. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised you don't know that. Like, yeah, I don't know that because it's not true. I guarantee you, if, if I had a 6.4 Hemi, I could run boost on it. They told me that about the 5.7 Hemi. Yeah, I can't run boost on those. Those pistons are, are made of the same material that my 4L60 transmission is made out of. I said, no, they're not. The, you're not doing the tune right, and you're not putting ring gap in it, and that's the problem. 
And voila, we make a thousand horsepower out of a stock bottom end. I don't know that that's the case of the 6.4, but I'm certain I can run eight or 10 pounds on the 6.4 without any problem. Uh, budget 426 race Hemi, except that for, if it's a 426, it's going to be a 426 Gen 4 Hemi, or Gen 3. Rex is in the house. Uh, a Hellcat blower would work on an LS. Uh, I don't know if people have done adapters for those. And I, the other thing I don't know is, did they sell a lot of those Hellcats? And are there a lot of used Hellcat blowers running around? Thinking about using Tom's adapter on a 3.7 Cyclone engine. Aaron, what's going on, man? One more minute. Uno minuto mas. Yeah, the 671 blowers have been around a long time. Aaron, you're here. That's all that matters. Every, every motor loves boost. So we're going to see some Magnum testing uh, soon, I hope. I'd like to see an extra injector. So you want to blow fuel through the blower? That'd be cool if you could make an adapter for the Mopar guys. Part of the problem with that is you have to have an intake manifold. Um, otherwise, you have to adapt it to um, like a four-barrel intake manifold. Unless you just milled off the whole top of the kegger. Okay, we're going to close out our poll at 82% saying yes. <laughs> I wonder if my poll was, am I ever going to get a 100% poll? <laughs> Tom, happy to help, man. Oh, cap blower is a 2.2 liter twin screw by IHI. Yep. That's actually a pretty decent blower. And I think you can run a lot of blower speed with those. Richard, did you ever see the streamliners with the 671 mounted down low and you driven off the crankshaft? Yeah, they had, they ran one of those at West Tech. Um, it's actually the guys, um, Clay Smith. It was those guys. And theirs was a small block that was 183 cubic inches. So it had all kinds of cool. And it had that kind of blower on it. Uh, Tom does have a website. I think you can, you can ask him if you have a question here. Kurt, it is, it might be beverage time, right? Although it is, it is a school night. <laughs> so Admiral, you'd mess it up for us. Sean, 5.3 with twin GT45s only put down 438 horsepower at 11 PSI. You have some sort of big problem going on there. One GT45 with a 5.3 11 PSI should be way over that. 11 PSI with 11 PSI even on a stock 5.3 without a cam in it is going to be 600.
popped in. That's that's the guys that I was talking about, the crank driven six seventy ones. That's who I was thinking of. I was trying to think of the name. Okay, guys, I got to get going. Thank you all for showing up. Make sure to take a look at the video that I put up about the bypass valve. <laughs> the pole. It's all about the pole. <laughs>